The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us today at the March California Nevada Drought Early Warning System Drought and Climate Outlook webinar. Um, thank you for those that have joined us previously and those that will be joining us for the first time. Um, my name is Amanda Sheffield, and I'm from Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, and I'm the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for the National Integrated Drought Information System, specifically for, for um, California and Nevada. This bi-monthly webinar series is designed to provide the region with timely information on current drought status and associated impacts, as well as a preview of developing climatic events. Um, this, I will mention this webinar is co-hosted by the California Nevada Applications Program, which is a NOAA recent team. Um, before we get started, I'll mention that this webinar is being recorded, and so a recording of it, as well as a two-page um, summary, will be on drought.gov later this week and on the NIDIS YouTube channel. Um, before I pass it off to our first speaker, I'll just mention that, um, a little bit more about NIDIS. NIDIS is National Integrated Drought Information System. Our mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risk and by providing the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to those effects. Um, you can find my, more information about us on drought.gov, which is the national drought portal. In California, Nevada, the Drought Early Warning System is um, utilizes the new and existing partner networks here of the federal, tribal, state, local, and academic partners to do those efforts, including making climate and drought science and impact data readily available, easily, easily understandable, and usable, use, usable, sorry, excuse me today, usable for decision makers to improve those capacities to better monitor, monitor and plan for and cope with drought. Um, basically, we have a lot of activities in priority areas, a collaborative due network, including those speakers that are on today, and we work on ways to improve um, to use communication outreach, including webinars like this. Um, uh, before we get started, too, I just want to briefly mention that if you're curious, um, on drought.gov, one of the newest news stories we have right now um, from the NOAA's National Center of Environmental Information put these together, looking at what the most intense drought in 2018s have been and the number of weeks in drought. Here I've just pulled out California and I've had to give you a sense of, so what drought did we have last year that you'll hear today has improved um, and how many weeks we were there in those D1 to D4 categories according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. So there's a new article on drought.gov if you want to dig into those and look at those a little bit deeper for our region and anywhere in the country. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we've got three great speakers today. Um, first up is going to be the drought and climate update that we traditionally do. Um, it's going to be provided by Professor Stephanie McAfee. She's at University of Nevada, Reno, and she's the Nevada Step Deputy State Climatologist. And Steph, I'll pass control over to you. Okay. Hi, all. So oh, show this window. Okay, here we go. So can you all see the slides? Uh, we see a white screen right now. Okay. Sharing. Show. There we go. We're good. There we go. Okay, good. Sorry, it was just taking a minute to connect, apparently. Um, so as Amanda said, really the big news in the drought and climate update is about the recession of drought over Nevada and California. Um, and this is something that we've seen not just within the scientific and management community, it's made the news as well. Um, this <coughs> is from KCS, KSBY.com from just oh, a week and a half ago that the California drought is officially over after more than seven years. Um, so that's, is kind of a long time to be in drought. Um, but as you can see, looking at the March 19th drought monitor, so this is the last one that we had available, um, you can see California has a little bit of D0. In Nevada, we're looking at D0 and some relatively small areas of D1, moderate drought. Um, and this has come after quite a long time. So <clears throat> here you can see the time series of 
the percent area in California that was in drought from back in October of 2011. All right, we have started to see some drought building from 2011 into 2012. Of course, we all knew about, we all experienced that real severe drought from 2014 to 2016. But even after the really wet winter of 2016, 2017, there were still close to 20% of California in abnormally dry or droughty conditions that flared up again as we had went into the spring and summer. But as you can see, we're now right about down here. Um, less than 7% of California was in D0. So not even really drought, just abnormally dry. Um, 31% of Nevada, which experienced a really similar past tra drought trajectory to California, is now dry, is now um, not in drought. So only 4% of the state in drought. Another, say, 27% is abnormally dry right now. Um, this is not quite as good as back in <coughs> after the summer of 2017, where we had just a couple percent of the state in abnormally dry. Um, but Still, it's looking good. Um, we're not heading into the spring in significant drought in either state. Um, this is a very big change from the start of the water year. Um, if, if you look at September 25th, that was the sort of last um, drought monitor update uh, before the start of the 2018-2019 water year, 94% of Nevada was in drought or abnormally dry, as was 88% of California, and Southern California was, uh, some decent chunks of that were in D3 extreme drought. So really we've seen a huge reduction in drought conditions over the two states just throughout the course of the winter. Um, in much of this area, we are at or above normal precipitation from the start of the water year. Um, as you're seeing here, the percent of normal precip map from the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Um, most areas are at 110 to over to 150 to 200 percent of normal precipitation, barring a couple dry areas right along the Northern California coast in Southern California and along the California Nevada border. But I will say this area in here is it's a perennially data poor area. So um, kind of take that with a little bit of a grain of salt exactly how large that area is. Um, we didn't start the fall off looking like this was going to be an especially good winter. Um, here's showing October through December percent of normal precipitation. <coughs> and you can see a couple areas, Southern California um, and Northern Nevada were doing okay, but much of the region was still looking pretty dry at say 25 to 90 percent of normal precipitation. This was definitely a little worrying. Um, you know, getting to kind of the halfway point of the winter. Uh, but then February happened. Uh, for those of you who were up in the mountains, the hashtag February uh, was thrown about all over social media. Uh, certainly we had places setting 24 hour snow total records. And uh, while the high elevation snowpack is maybe not quite where it was in the winter of 2016, 2017. Um, many of these, many of the mid and lower elevation areas actually do did get quite a bit of snow, perhaps more than two winters ago. Um, so if we were to look in the Northern Sierra at the eight station index, here we are, we're at 130% of normal. Um, you know, again, not, quite up there with where we were in our very wettest winters, but certainly above average. Uh, the same is true looking in the Tulare Basin at the six station index. And in the San Joaquin at the five station index. 
<coughs> again, certainly not in the wettest, but well above normal, which is pretty good considering um, a bunch of time in the fall and the early part of the winter that we did spend with below normal precip. Um, it was has also not been a particularly warm winter. Um, you can see here across most of the region, uh, we were between four degrees below normal and in a couple small areas between two and four degrees above normal. So pretty close to kind of normal conditions, cooler over Nevada, maybe slightly warmer than normal over California. Um, and February, again, was really quite cold <coughs> with, <coughs> pardon me, I have caught a cold and I guess the cough is starting. Um, temperatures, you know, six to 12 degrees below normal in some parts of the Northern Sierra and in Nevada. So again, lots of that February, that really heavy February precipitation was coming in cold storms. So in many places coming as snow. Um, and as a result, if we look at the snow water equivalent over the West, um, certainly we're not really seeing all that many stations below the 1981 to 2000 median. Uh, a lot of basins are at 125, 150, um, almost over, in some cases, over 200% of normal SWE for late March. So the snowpack is doing pretty well across California and Nevada, and even into the Colorado basin as well. So for you know those of you in the southern parts of California and Nevada, who are looking to Colorado for water as well. Um, certainly the snowpack is doing nicely in that region as well. Um, if we look at Nevada reservoir storage, most of the basins <coughs> have more than, are at 100% of their average capacity for this time of year or above. Um, the one exception for Nevada would be Lake Mead. Again, though, this is quite early in the season for Lake Mead. Um, in Cal Northern California, we're seeing most things at or above where we would expect them to be for this date. And ditto in Southern California, again, just with the big reservoirs on the Colorado system at about half of where we might expect to see them for this time of year. However, the water supply forecasts from the Colorado River Basin Forecast Center are generally looking pretty good. Um, <coughs> and Colorado, as you know, we can see from a couple slides back, did have a, a, a pretty epic snow year. Um, some stations in the southwestern part of the state uh, with over 200% of median SWE. Uh, now, one place where we're not seeing quite as clear cut a signal perhaps is in the vegetation. Um, so here we're looking at the veg dry, uh, where greens are really showing vegetation that's in recovery, lusher than normal, but some areas of red and brown, they're really uh, showing vegetation that is experiencing drought-like conditions or displaying drought-like conditions. Um, we see this sort of especially in some parts of Northeast Nevada, that white is out of, not covered, but um, you're seeing a lot of yellow and red in these areas, in some cases interspersed with green. Um, up here in the Northwestern part of this region. And we're also similarly seeing some circular areas in the veg dry. Now it's unclear to me what whether, how much this might be displaying um, sort of <coughs> past drought impacts that are difficult to recover from. But in general, we're seeing a pretty consistent response in a, a generally good vegetation response across both states. So uh, in summary, there are really kind of three big messages. It doesn't look like we'll be heading into summer in drought, which is, uh, I think, a very exciting way to be headed into spring. 
Most reservoirs are where we would expect them to be for this time of year. That's great. Um, and while vegetation is recovering, there do appear to be some lingering vegetation impacts. Uh, I know Amanda had hoped to have some of the veg dry folks come talk about that product today that would it would maybe give us a little more insight into some of those apparently drought impacted areas. But we seem to be in good condition heading into the spring. All right, thanks Steph. Um, I forgot to mention to folks that if you have a question, please feel free to type it in. We'll do a few here if we can quickly, um, but we'll save most of them for the end. Um, but yeah, here, Steph, here's a quick question is, couldn't the Southern dry area in CA in California be due to the Santa Barbara fire? Um, maybe the way you were just showing in veg dry is what they're referring to. Yeah, I, I think it certainly could. Um, I would need to do, I don't think they do a fire mask on the veg dry. Not sure if anyone else knows, um, but that would uh, certainly account for that if there's not fire masking. Thank you. And then Pete, I just passed it over to you. Um, so our next speaker is Pete Fickenshire with the um, National Weather Service's California Nevada River Forecast Center. And Pete, go ahead and start. All right, thanks Amanda. And uh, thanks Stephanie for a good intro. Um, again, my name's Pete Fickenshire. I'm a hydrologist here at the Weather Service's California Nevada River Forecast Center. And so while well, I'm not a uh, climate scientist for the last 20 years, I have been a, a heavy user, I guess, of climate products and have uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand climate signals in our regions to better forecast the rivers, both in terms of flooding, but also especially water supply. Uh, water supply forecasting is a big effort that we do here in our office. And uh, this is, of course, any, heading right into the snowmelt season, so everyone's really looking hard at how much water we can expect uh, over the coming months. So we're going to dive right into kind of some of the um, products that are coming out of CPC, the Climate Prediction Center. This is borrowed from their uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation update that they issue every week. Um, and this is looking at a combination of an international set of models as well as the climate prediction set of uh, different models, uh, both the observed you kind of see here in February, we're in a slight warming signal uh, in the tropical Pacific. So we had a uh, kind of a weak to moderate El Nino uh, brewing right now. And then the models going forward are kind of this plume of uh, different scenarios, of what could uh, happen in the future in the tropical, tropical Pacific. And that'll really influence a lot of what can happen both in terms of the summer, the spring, summer, and into next fall. And you can see there's still a wide uh, plume of things happening here. Um, the red line you might notice is a dynamical model average. And so that's uh, looking at uh, some of the models that are uh, looking at sea surface temperatures um, in a physical manner. Then there's also the green line, which is our statistical model. But one caveat that they always are saying this time of year is what they call the spring predictability barrier. That, in essence, the models tend to be, I've even heard this in their blogs, that they're very unreliable this time of year during March and April. And so while they continue to show kind of a, a continued El Nino pattern over the, uh, over the next several months, uh, that predictability or that, that strength of their models during this time of year is, pretty, is actually fairly low. And this is taken from the, uh, the Climate Prediction Center. They have a blog that they issue uh, pretty much every month as they update the El Nino diagnostic discussion. And again, you can see the purple line is where uh, we've come to. Um, again, coming, it's been at a moderate or weak to moderate El Nino uh, status in the tropical Pacific. And going forward, again, this plume shows, again, the broad range of possibilities uh, going out into the fall and uh, all the way out into October, November, December of next year. There's still a lot of uncertainty, although a lot of the models are still hinting that we might continue in an El Nino state uh, all the way into uh, next fall. 
And so what are the probabilities of that happening? I'm going to show two graphs here. The first one is the model-based uh, El Nino outlook. And so again, look, looking at these models, uh, what is the probability that we're going to stay in an El Nino status? And so during March, April, and May, we're pretty much already there. 90% uh, chance we're going to continue to see that El Nino state uh, going into the spring. But as we head into the summer, again, predictability starts to go down. And by the fall, um, they're only showing about a 60% chance of continued El Nino conditions. Well, that's the model-based uh, look at it. And then if you actually come out with their, their official probabilistic outlook, again, those numbers go down a bit out here in the summer and fall, again, primarily due to that uh, unreliability of the climate models that far out. And so in summary, you know, that we are in a currently in an El Nino uh, status, and we've seen a lot of actually impacts to be interesting. Um, if Stephanie has any comments maybe later about any connection between El Nino and what we've seen in terms of precipitation uh, over the past winter so far. Um, but El Nino conditions really did pick up in the, over the last month or two. Uh, the sea surface temperatures are above average currently and are predicted to continue that way. And so, um, and the, the atmosphere has really responded as well. And so you have the combination of the sea surface and the atmosphere responding to um, in an El Nino-like pattern. And so that's going to continue, they think, with an 80% chance in, during the spring and then 60% chance out into the summer of this year. And so what does that mean in terms of precipitation and temperature for our region? And I wanted to bring these up. These are one of the things that I think go into their forecast maps. We'll look at their forecast maps uh, shortly. But these are uh, CPC composites. So they're looking here at, at three things. First one, um, on the left-hand column are the anomalies. So what happens during these 13 El Nino years that you see at the bottom? Uh, is it wet or is it dry? In terms of precipitation for April through June, uh, the spring months, there's typically more uh, precipitation in the south and less in the north of California and Nevada. But then they also look at the trend. What's uh, the last 10 years been like? And trying to take away that trend that might be influencing these anomalies. And that, so at the bottom then is the composite plus the trend, which still shows kind of a wet signal for California. But the right-hand column is something that is important too, which is the frequency. So even though there might be a wet trend in the overall precipitation, if the, the frequency of that is fairly low, that gives them less certainty of forecasting uh, that the spring is going to be wet or dry. And you can see for most of California and Nevada, uh, there's very little beyond kind of this 50%, whether it's frequently happening wet or frequently happening dry. And so that gives them very little confidence in the precipitation, I think, going forward. Looking at temperature, uh, there's a little bit more confidence. There's a little bit of a warm signal uh, in the northern part of California. And then the trend of, has certainly been towards warmth over the last 10 to 15 years. And so their composite plus trend forecast then looks uh, fairly warm over you know, a, a tendency towards warm. Again, this is very uh, small amount, maybe a half a degree of, uh, centigrade. but there is definitely a, a, a warm signal there. And also, if you look at the frequency of the composite plus the trend, you're seeing above, well above, um, you know, 50 to 60, even close to 70 percent of this happening over time in the northern part of California and Nevada. So that's led to these two maps. Uh, again, this is the April through June temperature outlook from CPC, um, showing that warm trend. Uh, uh, a shift in the probabilities again. These are probabilistic outlooks that there's a greater chance that we could have a warm uh, spring, which will be interesting with uh, all the snow that we have up in the mountains. And then in terms of temperature, or in terms of precipitation, though, here we have very, again, very little signal or sense. There is a wet trend kind of further east of here, but in terms of uh, California has no. Uh, outlook of wetter or drier, um, but Nevada has maybe a slight chance of being 
uh, a little bit wet on the far eastern part of Nevada. And uh, Stephanie already mentioned a little bit about snow, but I just wanted to mention it since that's what I've been doing a lot over the last uh, month or two. Um, this is this morning's kind of camera. Again, a, maybe a picture is worth a thousand words, but um, from Sentinel Dome looking out at Half Dome in Yosemite Valley, and you can see an abundant snowpack. And as Stephanie mentioned, the mid to low elevation snow is, is quite impressive this year. Uh, the combination of a wet February, about 250% of average uh, wetness, and then combine that with very, very cold temperatures, gave us a snowpack that is probably almost double what we normally are, had seen two years ago um, in those mid to low elevation zones, kind of from five to 8,000 feet. And so we've been analyzing that kind of as Stephanie was showing, looking at the uh, snow pillows and measurements of snow throughout the region. And as Stephanie mentioned, there's a lot of above average uh, snowpack that we're seeing. And then we take that and run those through our hydrologic models. Again, um, melting the snow off uh, during the spring, we combine that with the soil model underneath. And um, one of the things that's been interesting for us to see is that even though the snowpack is kind of approaching the levels we saw two years ago in 2017, uh, there's still a fair amount of dryness in the soil. We went straight into this water year um, with a fairly dry fall, especially uh, October through mid-November were extremely dry and then went straight into snowpack or snow accumulation. And uh, so we think that that's kind of toning things down, but again, the snowpack is so large that most of our points that we're forecasting here in California and Nevada are get, see, expected to see anywhere from 100% oh, to 150, 180% of average uh, runoff during the April through July uh, time period. Humboldt River is also seeing, uh, again, a good, uh, good snowpack and snow melt potential that we're expecting. By the one dry region, it's kind of been uh, pointed out earlier as well as the upper Klamath River still seems to be a below average, uh, both in terms of, primarily in terms of its runoff potential. I think snowpack were kind of closer to average. And then uh, we work also side by side here in our office with the California Department of Water Resources. This is a daily update map that they have. And again, to highlight in the red circles here that the uh, full reservoirs that we have. And so um, going into the future here, we're, the main problem is not the lack of water, but certainly managing uh, an abundance of water and, and being able to manage the flows uh, during the snowmelt season. And so to conclude here, um, CPC also puts out a drought outlook, what the uh, future pattern that they see, again, with the El Nino and also current conditions, um, what that will look like in terms of any impact on the drought. And that one little uh, spot of D1 that's it's our, you know, moderate drought that we still see in eastern Nevada is expected to be removed over the next three months. Uh, and then also it's interesting to see if they're forecasting a little bit of improvement just in the northern uh, end of California as well. So that concludes uh, my outlook for the spring here. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thanks Pete. Um, I don't see any questions right at this time, but if you do have any, feel free to fill them in and we'll catch up with them at the end. Um, okay, and so next we're gonna move on to our third speaker before we do all the questions. Um, next up is Katie Steele. Um, she is a coordinator with the USDA Southwest Climate Hub and she's gonna tell us a bit about their organization. Um, so Katie, I'm gonna pass control over to you and you can share your screen or PowerPoint. Thanks. I'm going to show you the screen. Oh, I've got two screens here, so I'm a little technically challenged. So I think I can show you the screen of monitor two and tell me if that's what you're yep. seeing when I start. You yeah. see that? Yeah, we see okay. the PowerPoint, yeah. And you'll hit, you're about to hit slideshow. <laughs> yes. Oh, we okay. See, um, I'm sorry, we see presenter view version. Can you swap it for the other type of view? Yes. Whoops. Um, 
We can view it that way too, but either way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just uh, figuring this out. I am so sorry because this is, oh, there we go. I just uncheck use presenter view. That's simple as that. I think so. Okay. And it's still not showing on the right slide, I, um, on the right screen, I'm sorry. Let me just uh, check the show screen, show screen of monitor one. How about that? There we go. You're good. Great. Okie dokes. So um, apologies for my little false start there. Um, my name is Katie Steele, and I'm the coordinator of the Southwest Climate Hub. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the hub network and then about the Southwest Climate Hub, our background and some key projects that we've been working on. So this is a map of the 10 hub regions. And for the most part, each hub covers multiple states. So for example, here in the Southwest, we cover Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah. We also cover Hawaii, and we also cover the US affiliated Pacific Islands. Um, we're not part of the California hub, or California are not part of our hub, but we do work closely with them on several projects. So our mission in the hubs is to develop and deliver science-based regional specific information and technologies to agricultural and natural resource managers and communities. And I want to highlight here, it's to enable climate informed decision making. So we aim to have everything that we do be something that actually has an outcome that makes a difference. And then on top of that, we are charged with providing assistance to implement those decisions. So each hub was formed in uh, 2014 under Secretary Bill Sack. So we've been around for five years now. And this is just a snapshot of our hub team members. There's Emily Elias, who's the director, and myself, the coordinator, and Julian Reyes, the hub fellow. Helena Deswood, who works on tribal outreach and coordination. And we've also got Chuck Peacock, NRCS liaison, Joel Brown, NRCS co-lead, and Christian Giardina and Bryce Richardson, Forest Service co-leads. So what's important about this is that we are an ARS hub and we're based in Las Cruces, New Mexico and Rangeland Research. And Forest Service hubs have a similar setup, maybe not quite so many team members, but they will have ARS members or ARS co-leads and NRCS co-leads. And I wanted to highlight here Connie Maxwell's special projects. She doesn't have an official hub role, but she is one of the people that holds us all together. And I want to mention our students. We have a whole bunch of students that work with us. Um, so one of the things I wanted to emphasize too is that we're at the Honada Experimental Range. Honada has a hundred years of rangeland research under its belt, or more. And being a rangeland research center, we don't necessarily have all the expertise to cover all the subjects that we are required to cover. So this is where our steering committee comes in, as well as our co-leads. So we have a steering committee um, built up of folks from multiple agencies and partnerships, including USDA, Farm Service Agency, Risk Management Agency, Rural Development. Um, we have got partnerships with universities such as University of New Mexico, Utah State University, and with centers based at universities such as Desert Research Institute or the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Too many to mention here, I think. So the functional structure of the hubs is to work at the interface of science and services. So for those of you who know ARS locations, they're very research oriented. And forest service locations, well, it depends on uh, which office you're in, whether you're in the research or in the management, but you, you do see um, much more science at the ARS. So to make sure that we're working at this interface of science and services, we've been charged with tool development and technology transfer, stakeholder outreach and education, 
and also the research science translation information synthesis. So there's less emphasis on the primary research, but more about synthesizing information and making it useful. And here are some of the environments in which we are expected to work. So rangelands, of course, forests, livestock of all types, whether or not it's range based or internally based, crops and communities is becoming much more important. So the time horizons in which the hubs work, I wanted to emphasize this too, because the time horizons when you're talking about climate change are often going to be over a much longer time period. And we do work on climate change issues, either in the past or in historical climate change and precedence to the issues that we see now with the change in climate, but also future climate to mid-century or end of century. But one of our more day-to-day -day activities focus on is contemporary issues, whether it's weather or changes happening this year, such as a short-term drought or a longer-term drought over five years, or this growing season. So we don't just work on climate change, we work on climate variability as well. And I wanted to emphasize again to the partnerships that we have. We work with all the USDA agencies, with the BLM, the USDI BLM, with climate science adaptation centers, and we did work with the former landscape conservation cooperatives, with NOAA Reeses, with NIDAS Dues, universities, extension, academics, with tribes, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the only way in which we could get everything done in order to cover our remit is with these partners. So some of our 2018 major accomplishments include research and science synthesis. And I want to call out our completed special issue in climatic change. This was based on a 2015 vulnerability assessment, which I'll bring up in just a second. Our director also participated in NCA4 um, as part of the Southwest team. We launched the AgRisk viewer, which I'll talk about, and we also, oh goodness, look at that typo, expanded GrassCast in partnership with the Northern Plains Climate Hub, and I'll talk about GrassCast too. In education, we actually work with the Asombro Institute for Science Education, and they produce materials for science teachers from um, K through 12, but this is a, a, a climate change and agricultural module that's for grades six through 12. It can be adapted and it aligns with all the current science standards. And tribal engagement is particularly important. And this is a slow but solid process led by our um, tribal coordinator, Helena Desmond. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Helena too, because um, we didn't realize how much, how important this is until we held a recent meeting in Arizona and because of the partnerships she's been building, we were able to reach out to tribes to come and join in with this drought workshop. And outreach, the drought response meetings and also drought monitor meetings that we've been holding and working with extension. So this is just a snapshot of the vulnerability assessment. This was actually published in 2015 and it's available through this URL down here at the bottom of the screen and it's a synthesis of all the major related climate issues in each um, well each climate hub region ran one or did one of these synthesizing information for this um, but we worked on the southwest and California alongside the California hub and this was what it turned into, Volume 38, Issue 3 of Climatic Change Special Issue. All the papers in this, in case you're interested, they're all open access, if you fancy taking a look. Um, for California, one of the foci was uh, the impact of climate change on specialty crops. So in terms of outreach, some of the work that we've been doing is focusing on drought workshops. We've had seven drought workshops since 2016 and five of those have been in partnership with the National Drought Mitigation Centre. Now probably most of you on this call are very familiar with the drought monitor maps but there's we 
found that there's many of our stakeholders, while they use the drought monitor maps, they weren't quite sure of how they were put together, and they were certainly not aware that they could make contributions to the map making process. So our goal of these workshops was to increase stakeholder engagement. And I've started that because stakeholders for our hub really uh, range from producers, ranchers or farmers or forest land managers all the way to our partners in the USDA, the Farm Service Agency, Risk Management Agency, NRCS, Forest Service and so forth. So our goal was to increase stakeholder engagement with the drought monitor process, either through the list serve, which informs the drought monitor authors of feedback as the map is being produced, or through drought impact reporting, which gives a, a longer term um, basis of information, and also COCARAs. So our objectives in, this, um, in these workshops were to demonstrate the history of the drought monitor maps and how they're produced weekly, that rather frenzied period where the poor map author is uh, getting so much information that their email inboxes are full, um, communicating the importance of local knowledge about drought impacts. So people don't realize that their knowledge is valuable to the drought monitor authors. And I can tell you this firsthand, they often surprised that they can contribute information about drought impacts. And then important in the West, especially in um, those dryland states is filling in the gaps with volunteer precipitation monitoring using networks that exist already, such as the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network, or My Range, which is run at University of Arizona. The outcomes we've been measuring here are increased knowledge about engagement with about sorry and engagement with the USDM process and increasing COCARAS observers. One of the most successful outcomes has been the Farm Service Agency taking a lead in drought impact reporting in Utah, where formerly they were not particularly connected with the drought reporting process. So grass cast on this slide is one of our science to services examples. It is led by the Northern Plains Hub. Now grass cast in a nutshell basically takes relationships, known relationships between precipitation and forage, so precipitation, evapotranspiration and forage production uh, to produce seasonal outlooks of what forage production might be in a particular uh, county on, in the plains area. And you might be asking, well, what's this got to do with California or Nevada because it is the plains area? So while this is a looking ahead product it's a forecast product because it uses cpc outlooks to give seasonal forage forecasts we have been talking with farm service agency and other folks about making this a hindcast product so using precipitation over the season relating that to production and producing county level estimates of seasonal production based on remotely sensed data so if you want to learn a little bit more about grass cast, I've included the link here, but also can send that to anybody who's curious to learn more. So one, this is the final thing I'll talk about today. It's the Agrisk viewer. So the Agrisk viewer, basically what this is, is a viewer that allows you to look at USDA risk management agency data in a much more simple format. Now, if you've tried to look at risk management agency data in the past, it's available from the website, but it is available in comma delimited value data sets, which are great if you know how to code or if you're familiar with R, or if you've got a lot of patience with Excel. So what our hub fellow did, Julian Reyes, was in partnership with a computer developer here, so a software developer here, rather, at the Honada, was to develop this web interface. So you could look at risk management agency data on um, indemnities and losses and acreage affected using this simple interface. So one of the motivations for doing this is we know that extreme weather events and long-term climate change affects agricultural production and food security. You look at 2016, for example, there was over 100 plus billion of crops insured, or so 100 plus billion dollars worth of crops were insured 
through the federal crop insurance program. And the question is, can this crop insurance data tell us about weather and climate impacts? So if we look at the US drought monitor map for 2012, and then we look at the RMA crops indemnities 2012 map, where most of the payments were, and Julian's colored this in a similar color to the drought monitor map, but we can see very clearly that crop insurance data can tell us about climate impacts on agriculture because these are primarily the drought impacts data. So expected outcomes from this project, well, we hope to be able to inform future RMA programs, but to also to provide regionally relevant information and provide targeted adaptation. So this is a screen grab of the Ag Risk Viewer. Now I haven't gone into exactly what it shows you yet, but this slide will hopefully clarify that a little. So it's an interactive data viewer and it gives you on the fly data analysis. You've got a choice of spatial units, either the state or the county level. You can look at different temporal resolutions of data, monthly or annual. And the variables of interest that you can look at at your state or county level and your monthly or annual level include the cause of loss. So was it drought or excess precipitation or rain, hail, decline in price, heat or freeze or flooding, the commodity, what kind of crop was insured. And you can also look at losses by acreage or by the dollar amount of loss. So this map here is basically showing all causes of loss, 1989 to 2016. And it shows across that period of time, drought was the biggest cause of loss, followed by excess precipitation or excess moisture and flooding and excess wind, cold weather down there at the bottom, not quite so um, important in that time period as causes of loss. But you can look at the county level or the different temporal resolutions and you can tease out where these variables, where these causes of loss become more important just by using this Ag Risk Viewer. So if you look at the nationwide cause of loss, there's drought with excess precipitation, excess moisture being the largest causes of loss. And we can look at the indemnities as well from this viewer and if they we can find that the biggest, um, the crops that are most severely affected are those commodities, which we would kind of would expect would be insured by the big producers, but corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton, sorghum, tobacco, and so forth. And this is a temporal work. So um, we're looking at 2001 to 2016. And using the viewer here, this is a, a graph that Julian produced himself, but you can download the data um, quite easily from our website to reproduce this graph. Um, or you can ask the website to draw a simpler bar chart for you. But we look at the cause of loss over time across the nation. And we can see 2012 standing out there, of course, as the big drought year in the um, plains and in the middle of the country. But we can see other years where losses haven't been quite so bad or where excess moisture precipitation etc have been more important and this is just a look at the county level causes of loss We've got 2012 and 2015 standing out there so again you can see the spatial pattern of loss just by looking at the county level and across the nation but there are many different ways in which you can use this tool. Like I said before, you can tease out information at the county level or at the state level, which would be more relevant perhaps to local decision making. And this is just a look at the Southwest by state, by crop, and of course, those Julian's um, animation, Bouncing California. In. So here we're looking at the period again, 2001 to 2016. And by state, we can see that heat was actually a big issue in California, followed by failure in irrigation supply. And failure in irrigation supply isn't your irrigation equipment breaking down. That is failure in your water supply, which would make sense, of course, in California. In Nevada, 
again, failure in irrigation supply, supply being a very big issue. And these are the main crops. This is kind of swayed by the cut. This is the whole of the Southwest, including um, California. So if we look at um, the crops that are affected, it's going to be because we've included California in this analysis, it'd be slightly skewed because of California's lead in crop production. So after that whistle stop tour of the ag risk view, which I thoroughly recommend you go and take a look at because there is, it does so much with the data sets, it's really quite, um, quite fun. I just wanted to highlight cooperative extension partnerships before I go. We are a fairly small team, we cover a really big area. So one of the ways in which we've been reaching out to our stakeholders is through cooperative extension. It makes perfect sense because Cooperative Extension are already actively engaged with stakeholders. Um, some of the successes I'd like to draw out here are Extension Climate Workshops at U of A, Hawaii, at the, um, in Guam, American Samoa, and in the Northern Mariana Islands. And that was all through, uh, well, for the, for the Pacific, that was all through U of H, through Hawaii. Um, the Stakeholder Weather and Climate Workshops at U of A, the climate change videos at USU and then at UNR a lot of um, non-profit collaboration and community outreach as well as the survey of climate needs which is currently being um, worked on for publication. So highlighting again two partnerships we couldn't do it without our partners if you're on this call and you're thinking you've got a project or something we could partner on we'd be very happy to talk to you. I'd like to encourage you to visit our updated website and with that i'll say thank you and hand back to amanda thanks katie um i'll quickly mention there was one question specifically to you to actually follow up per your suggestion on a potential collaboration so i'll send that info to you um, okay after. great yeah. yeah all right thanks everyone um so Thank you to our speakers, to Katie, Steph, and Pete for their great presentations. Um, I'll give folks a chance to enter in any more questions that are remaining. Um, there weren't any yet. Um, but just to remind everyone, while you're putting a question in, the recording from this webinar will be on drought.gov in the coming week, or even sooner than that on the NIDIS YouTube channel. Um, our next webinar is scheduled for um, Tuesday, May 28th, due to the holiday. We're going to be on a Monday this time. Um, here we go. And you can already find registration on drought.gov um, and we'll be sending that same information out in the post webinar email as well. Um, let's see. I don't see any questions popping up. So I guess with that, I'll go ahead and close the webinar and thank our speakers again. If you have any questions for them pop up after the webinar, please let us know. We can keep get you in contact with them. Um, along the way. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thank you.